Hi, everyone. Um, I'm happy to welcome you to our final um, Digital Humanities Initiative slash Digital Praxis course lecture of the semester. Um, my name is Matt Gold. I'm Associate Professor of English and Digital Humanities at the Graduate Center at City Tech. Um, and with my colleague Steve Breyer, I'm teaching this course called uh, Digital Praxis Seminar. Um, our idea is to really try and reach out to incoming students and to introduce them to the landscape of uh, digital work in their first semester here um, so that it's not that the first time they hear about various digital tools and methods isn't in their um, fourth or fifth year of, of uh, education. Um, we've been really excited all semester to have a great lineup of speakers um, on a range of uh, DH topics. Um, and we're, we're no less excited about today, today's lecture, which I think will be a, a great conclusion um, to our semester. Um, so I'm happy to welcome Simone Brown of University of Texas at Austin uh, today. Um, and I want to say a little bit about why uh, we wanted to invite Simone uh, to speak with us. Um, it's, it's not only, I think, because of her work, be but also, I think, because of what uh, we think digital humanities needs now, which is um, a greater attention um, to issues of race, issues of surveillance, um, and basically the, the kinds of things Simone is working on. Um, after the NSA prison program um, was kind of made public, recently, there was a debate on Twitter about whether digital humanists should be engaged in critical discussion around it, um, with some people saying that, you know, DHers, you know, might not have anything to necessarily to do uh, with the analysis of that type of program, and other people saying, you know, DHers who might have um, a sophisticated understanding of networks um, really have a kind of um, uh, a responsibility to speak out and to think critically about um, these, these kinds of uh, developments. Um, and, you know, simultaneously, there's been a increased attention, I would say, in recent years to how and whether the, the digital humanities community um, engages issues of race, of political action, um, and uh, kind of our, the relationship of our work to active um, issues that we are facing, sort of social justice issues. Um, and I think here again, uh, Simone's work really kind of answers a, a need and is uh, uh, really a great example of the kind of work that DHers can do that is engaged, that helps us think critically about the technologies around us, um, and that is a model of, of the kind of work we'd like to see our students doing. And so that's why we, we've brought her here today is to, um, to share her research, but also to serve um, as an example for how students who are just beginning to engage um, uh, the digital humanities can add uh, a, a political dimension to their work and think critically about networks and issues like uh, surveillance and um, uh, state-sponsored uh, surveillance. Um, so Simone is uh, assistant professor in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, she teaches and researches surveillance studies, biometrics, airport protocol, popular culture, digital media, and black diaspora studies. Um, she is working now on a uh, book that is under contract uh, with Duke University Press called Dark Matters on the Surveillance of Blackness. We're very pleased and excited to welcome Simone Brown today. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Matt, for that great uh, introduction. And thank you to the uh, Digital Praxis Seminar for the invitation to uh, come here and speak to you today about a bit of my uh, work. Um, as well, uh, thank you to Stephen Breyer as well uh, and Matt Gold for organizing uh, this here. So I use the title uh, Dark Surveillance uh, here to cue my extension of Steve Mann's concept of surveillance, um, what he describes as the inverse of surveillance through uh, the tactic of appropriating tools of social control controllers and resituating re these tools in a disorienting manner. And I use this, the term uh, dark surveillance to sit as a way to situate the strategies employed during the fight uh, or flight to freedom uh, from slavery as necessarily ones of undersight. So dark surveillance describes the ways that tools of social control in plantation surveillance and beyond were appropriated, uh, repurposed, co-opted, um, and, and also challenged uh, to facilitate escape. And you can 
can think here of uh, Ellen Craft escaping from slavery in 1848 uh, by uh, passing as a white man. Uh, you can also think here of Henry Box Brown, who uh, mailed himself to freedom in 1849 uh, in a box, that, a box that was three feet long and two feet wide. Uh, Harriet Jacobs, who escaped uh, to her mother's garret, basically an addict in her grandmother's home, uh, which she named as both her prison, but also her emancipatory loophole of retreat. So slave spirituals as coded messages were used to coordinate escape along the Underground Railroad. And so this archive of surveillance and slavery often goes missing from uh, surveillance studies. And so this is where my work makes an intervention, I think, in this emerging field of surveillance studies, by naming the um, absented presence of blackness. Absented in the sense that blackness is often um, absent um, from what is theorized and who is cited, while it's ever present, uh, for example, in the subjection of black motors to a disproportionate number of stops, stop and frisk, uh, the use of closed circuit uh, television as a kind of urban renewal renewal uh, tool or urban renewal project uh, in areas that are uh, uh, a subject for urban renewal or, where, or black city spaces uh, where blackness gets displaced. Mass incarceration and the various exclusions and other matters where blackness uh, meets surveillance and then reveals the ongoing racisms of unfinished emancipation. So you can think here of buying belts at Barney's or um, Renisha McBride and the recent killing uh, in, in Michigan and what Dream Hampton calls the criminalization of black corpses. Um, you can also think of uh, uh, baggy pants ordinances where pants that are worn below uh, the waist uh, get criminalized as fashion infractions or fashion crimes. Um, so of course this is not the entire story of surveillance, but it's often a part that goes missing in surveillance studies. So this is not to shade surveillance studies. I really think it's an, an exciting and emerging and very uh, transdisciplinary kind of, uh, uh, of uh, research. But my research broadly is guided by the following question. Uh, what can a realization of the conditions of blackness, the historical, the present, and also the historical present, help social theorists to understand about our contemporary conditions of surveillance? So I begin by situating the archive of slavery as a way to offer an historicizing of some of the concepts and concerns that now shape this emerging field of surveillance studies. This is to say that the historical formation of slavery is not outside of the, of the historical formation of surveillance. And I think the continuities that this archive uh, reveals give social theorists new ways of uh, understanding surveillance in contemporary life. So this is not to say that this type of work has not been done before by, say, Angela Davis or Joy James, um, also Bell Hooks, uh, Hortense Spillers. But to say that, uh, and, other, and other social theorists, but to say that there's a certain kind of citation politics within the field of sur surveillance studies that, that often doesn't engage with their contributions in uh, meaningful ways. And I hope my work can do an intervention in that case. So what I'm going to talk about today is a chapter from my book, uh, Dark Matters on the Surveillance of Blackness. And so a word on methodology um, for this part. Uh, new configurations of surveillance require a creative approach, and this is a mode of research research that must take on a sense of what uh, black feminist theorist and sociologist Patricia Hill Collins calls a, quote, writing across time, meaning an approach that's in dialogue with and also honors earlier institutional uh, projects, uh, political projects that sought to theorize and challenge certain injustices. And so writing across time is a critical methodology of surveillance in relation to blackness. And this method of out analyzing the conditions of blackness brings historical documents, interviews, digital art, photography, popular film and television, and the various other forms of cultural production into dialogue with feminist theorizing and critical race theorizing. And so I'll begin, I'll present this work in three parts. The first section is branding blackness, and I provide a discussion of branding uh, and its role in the making of uh, the racial subject as commodity in the ports of the transatlantic slave trade. I do this to, in order to situate branding or slave branding as a form of racializing surveillance. So branding as a form of identification, but also as a form of corporal punishment in plantation uh, uh, plantation settings and also settings of uh, urban domestic slavery. So you can think of, we often understand pl plantations or slavery as something as a, a southern uh, project, but you can think of urban domestic uh, slavery in, in spaces like New York City. <clears throat> And so to more clearly draw the links between uh, contemporary biometric uh, techno information technology and transatlantic slavery, I trace the archive of transatlantic slavery, mainly runaway notices, written accounts, a carte de visite. 
And so understanding uh, dark surveillance as a framework for uh, trying to think about surveillance can allow us to question how certain technologies or certain surveillance technologies instituted uh, during slavery to track blackness as property. You can think here of uh, slave patrols, uh, slave passes, branding, runaway notices, how these uh, technologies anticipate the contemporary surveillance of the racial body. The second section, I, I talk a little bit about, uh, uh, I draw on Frantz Fanon's theory of epidermalization to question how, uh, what the uh, racial epidermal schema that he makes plain, can we see this and find this in some of some recent uh, research and development in biometric technology? And biometric technologies, I mean things like the iris scanners and the fingerprint scans and facial recognition technology. And so to, to look at this question, I examined the role by what I uh, played by what I call prototypical whiteness in the making of some bodies and not others as problematic in biometric technology and its practices. And by practices here, I'm thinking about research and development um, coming out of the um, biometrics industry. I'll just show you an image of what prototypical whiteness or at least lightness might look like. This was uh, HP uh, in two, uh, Hewitt Packard in 2009. They uh, released a camera that would kind of follow the face and so this, this particular one had over, as you can see from this YouTube, uh, these two workers are in a store, one uh, a white woman apparently and a black man. And so the face, the, the program was calibrated to understand or to read lightness or whiteness. And when the black man would enter the screen, uh, he, the, the, they, the, it would not track his face. And then of course Hewitt Packard released, because this video got quite a few hits, Hewitt Packard released their own video with their own black worker who was able to, with proper lighting, they had to change the lighting to have the track movement. So to think about how uh, prototypical uh, whiteness or lightness operates is some of the you know, questions I want to ask. And in the final section, uh, branding blackness, um, I want to suggest here that popular representations or popular cultural representations of biometric technology and surveillance are one of the ways in which these technologies get sold and rationalized or branded uh, to the public. So the brand. Sometimes the crest of the sovereign, at other times alpha and numeric characters, denoted the relationship between the body and its said owner. I'm going to read a short excerpt from a 17th century account of branding um, in a slave barracoon by a French slave trader. A barracoon is like a barrack or a prison. Um, uh, the slave merchant described the process like this. When the Europeans are to receive them, they are brought out into a large plain where the surgeon examine every part of every one of them. Good and sound are set on one side, and the others by themselves. Which slaves so rejected are called macrones, being above 35 years of age, or defective in their limbs, eyes, or teeth, or grown gray, or have venereal disease, or any other infection? Each of the others which have passed as good is marked on the breast with a red-hot iron, imprinting the mark of the French, English, or Dutch companies that so each nation may distinguish their own. In this particular, care is taken that the women, as tenders, be burnt, not burnt too hard. So in this account, it tells us that branding was not only a mass corporate and crown exercise of registration of people by way of corporal markers, but it's an exercise that sought to categorize people, deemed who was most fit to labor unfreely, uh, that being the good and the sound, and distinguishing those from, uh, from others who are then literally imprinted with the mark of the sovereign. So think about the mark of the, the Dutch or the British crown uh, uh, imprinted. So slave branding was a racializing act, meaning that making blackness visible as commodity and therefore sellable, branding was a practice that sought to dehumanize and classify people into groupings. It just sought to, people always resisted uh, these, these uh, dehumanizing practices. But the, the idea was to produce new racial identities that were then tied to a system of exploitation in the West. And but as this quote details, branding was also a gendering act. As with it, as with it women were a certain discretionary uh, concern were taken with women. In this large plain turned factory, bodies were made disabled, and those named contagion or defective in their limbs, eyes, or teeth were rejected. So later in this count, uh, account, the slave merchant warns that Fida and Arda slaves are of all the others the most apt to revolt aboard ships by a conspiracy carried out amongst themselves. So this slave barracoon or the barracks, it seems, was also a space for ascribing a certain ontological link between race, ethnicity, and resistance and revolt.
So a useful concept for me here to think about this making of intergroup distinctions is what sociologist Joe Fegan has termed the white racial frame. Distinctions made by this uh, slave merchant and other merchants of slavery between the quote black and the fine and the quote lusty and strong speak to the early role of this dominant white racial frame in categorizing difference where blackness is framed as unruly with some said to be more unruly than others. So Joe Fegan outlines the dominant white racial frame as consisting of what he calls an anti-black subframe that worked to rationalize slavery and its attendant violences by branding blackness as bestial, alien, rebellious, among other markers of difference in the white mind. So the Dutch West India Company branded uh, enslaved people on arrival to Curaçao, um, sometimes right on the auction block. And so these scars that would remain on their body could be used uh, post-mortem uh, as, as to identify people at auction and in death. So the Dutch West India Company used Arabic numerals, uh, a, a numeral branding iron, until 1703, after which time the company began to use alphanumeric uh, branding irons in an A to Z sequence, with the exception of the letters U and J, so as not to be confused with the letters V and I. And the letter O was not used because the branding iron was worn down. So I want you to think here of what it means to have a branding iron be so worn down from use. Marked for death, branding sought to inscribe a premature death on black skin. For existence, for instance, sorry, for instance, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, the Gospel in Barbados in the, uh, the Caribbean, branded the word society on the chest of the people it enslaved in 1732. So this is the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, branding people on their chest. So one of the things I looked at is the, uh, is the diary of Thomas Thistlewood. He was an English planter and slave owner, and he tells of plantation conditions in 18th century Jamaica. I was particularly interested in the life of, a, of an enslaved woman named Cuba. Many of you might have uh, heard about Thistlewood in the news recently when Martin Bashir made a comment about Sarah Palin and slavery and excremental torture, and now he's not on MSNBC. But you can see that, uh, that uh, this archive and parts of it, uh, are avail all of it is available at Yale uh, right now uh, can tell us a lot about uh, the violence and the brutality of slavery. He kept very detailed files. Cuba was purchased by Thistlewood in 1761 and branded on her right shoulder with his brand mark, which is a TT in an inverted triangle. During the over 13 years that she was enslaved in Jamaica, Cuba escaped captivity numerous times, and each time she was recaptured, she was flogged, tortured. Uh, one time she escaped wearing a, a collar. And so one time she was branded on her forehead for punishment after, after an escape. And five, day, five days after that branding, she ran away. Uh, Coop, uh, Thistlewood wrote, wrote in his diary, Cuba wanting this morning. So in defiance of the brand, Cuba escaped again and again and made her own way. Eventually she was sold from Thistlewood for 40 pounds and transported out of Jamaica to, uh, to Georgia. So Cuba running away despite the TT that branded her skin uh, reveals the limits of these acts of dehumanization. She, Cuba, uh, she disrupts the practice of branding as punishment, accounting, and preemptive strike at marking the already hyper-visible body as identifiable outside of the plantation and other spaces of enslavement. So regardless of receiving this marking as slave, she ran away. So I want to look here at this uh, runaway notice. I'm just going to read parts of it here. It's from 1756, and it's, it's a poster reward for a Negro man named Cato, alias Toby. And it attests that he was branded when a boy in Jamaica in the West Indies, with a B and, I think, a C on his left shoulder plate shoulder blade, the advertisement states. In the advertisement, Cato is described as a sly and artful fellow who deceives by credulous, by pretending to tell fortune and pretends to be free. And so in this way, the B and the C on Cato's shoulder show, served as signs that could betray his identity despite his cunning use of an alias and other artful tactics. So although branding uh, during uh, slavery was a practice of racializing surveillance that sought to deny the black body to be multiply experienced, the idea that everybody would be marked society on their chest, running away, black escape, and numerous other counter practice uh, suggest that this dehumanization was not achieved on an effective level and that those branded were still ungovernable uh, under the brand uh, or in spite of it, like um, ex-slave Wilson Chin. 
So you can find a Wilson Chin, a branded slave from Louisiana, or at least the carte de visite on eBay.com and other online auction sites, sometimes going for $750 up to $1,000. Uh, being sold amongst other kind of uh, slavery's ephemera. Wilson Chin's portrait was taken around 1863, and in this particular portrait, a chain is tied around his ankle and various tools of torture around his neck and lay at his feet. A caption below the image reads, exhibiting images instruments of torture used to punish slaves. But not entirely visible um, on his forehead is marked VBM, uh, which is uh, Valsin Bonazir Marmillion, a Louisiana planter who branded uh, 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 Wilson Chin. So you can think of the brand here as a traumatic head injury uh, that, that sought to fix the black body as a slave, or at least attempted to. Chin escaped union lines in New Orleans. So Wilson Chin, the carte de visite, brings plantation, punishment, black escape, and also the continuing selling of, of, of slavery and its affirmer into um, focus. So Wilson Chin also marks this, the circulation of the archive of slave branding. And so these artifacts, such as this one here, live on as heirlooms for sale on the internet. And this particular one it was called Black Americana uh, Antique Slave Branding Iron from the 19th century. It was advertised for sale on eBay in 2008. And this was described as in fantastic condition with a unique design forged at the end to identify a particular slave. This, instru this instrument of torture was listed at a, as a buy, on a buy it now fixed price of $1,126 dollars and 25 cents with the option of a zero, zero uh, APR until 2009 if it was purchased with an eBay MasterCard. So the seller specified that, quote, from what I've read in research, each slave is normally branded twice, once in Africa, when leaving their country, and once in the Americas upon arrival. And that the branding iron can be purchased and then gifted to a museum for display for all to see and to learn here. And so one of the things, we don't know necessarily who's the, who the seller is, who the purchaser of these things, and what they'll be used for. Um, but just to think about this continued circulation of these, of these technologies. So the contemporary circulation of slavery era branding tools and other so-called uh, black Americana for sale on online auction spaces is questioned by conceptual artists and digital artists, Mende and Keith Obadike's Blackness for Sale. Uh, this piece of uh, digital art is from 2001 and that saw Keith Obadike auction his blackness on eBay as a way to disrupt the trade in slave memorabilia on the internet and the commodification of blackness more generally. So his auction was scheduled to last for 10 days, but was deemed inappropriate by eBay. And only after four days, it was removed from the website. The auction uh, garnered uh, 12 bids overall, the highest coming in at $152.50. So there's no image of, of, uh, of Keith uh, Obadike on the, uh, this particular uh, site. It's his blackness that is described as an heirloom. Um, Instead, potential buyers are provided with a list of benefits and warnings regarding Obadike's blackness, like the seller does not recommend that this blackness be used while making intellectual claims. <laughs> or the seller does not recommend that this blackness be used while voting in the United States or Florida. So Mende and Keith Obadike's project is one of black counterframing, where the institutionalized, institutionalized and everyday surveillance and negation of black life is satirized as a way to highlight this, the ways in which the kind of structural embeddedness of, uh, and persuasive nature of anti-blackness. And so this is a uh, anti-racist counterframing, uh, providing what you can call a counter systems analysis of the ways that uh, racism, white hostility, and discrimination operate structurally interpersonally. So blackness for sale then points to the productive possibilities of black expressive practices and perhaps starts satirically to the apparent limits of black anti-racist counterframing or as Mende and Keith Obadeke put it, this blackness may be used for writing critical essays or scholarships about other blacks. That was a joke. <laughs> So the second section I want to, I'll draw the links between the, the historical and the present by thinking about this notion of uh, digital uh, epidermalization. So in, in simple terms, biometric technology is the measuring of the living body. 
So with biometrics, uh, the body, or more increasingly uh, performance of the, performances of the body or parts and pieces of the body, are mathematically coded as data, making for so-called unique templates, and then put to use for verification or identification purposes. So the answering the question, um, are you who you say you are? Are you the, uh, the, the rightful holder of this passport or, um, or uh, driver's license where your unique biometric is encoded? Or, or, the verific or, sorry, that's verification. Or the other one, identification. Who are you in a face in the crowd? Uh, the, uh, you can use this, say, in a casino or in a, a sports, uh, a, you know, the, the Olympics or some large sporting event. And so popular biometric technologies uh, include uh, physiological features like iris and retinal scans, hand uh, geometry, fingerprint uh, templates, facial recognition, uh, vascular patterns, and increasingly DNA. And you also have like uh, behavioral traits, uh, voice analysis, uh, pen stroke and keystroke, how you type, uh, gait recognition. So for example, I had a friend uh, when I was in, uh, uh, well, I'll use, he's from Toronto, but since this is being live stream, I'll use, say Rob Ford was my friend. And so he would, he would walk very, had a very unique walk like this. And so this was in Toronto when I was in uh, like primary school. And so one day in, I guess the mid 2000s, I was in Austin, Texas, and I saw someone doing that same walk. And I was like, hey, is that Rob Ford? And so, and it turned out to be him. And so the idea that some people, or maybe Olivia Pope, have unique kind of gates or unique ways of walking, that could be then used as a, a, an identifier to then uh, match their identity to their walk. And so simply put, biometrics is the idea that the body will re reveal the truth about the subject despite the subject's claim. So the idea that I might say my name is Rob Ford, and then to the eye, but, the, but my body, whether it's my DNA, my fingerprint, my iris scan, or, 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 or some other piece of, or, or part of my body will reveal my true identities. So with the concept of digital epidermalization, I'm suggesting here that uh, biometrics research and development continues to rely on certain practices of what I'm calling prototypical whiteness, as well as, well as prototypical maleness, prototypical able-bodiedness, prototypical youthness uh, as well. This, this speaks to the ways in which uh, biometric information technologies are sometimes inscribed in racializing schemas that see certain bodies uh, privileged or at least uh, whiteness might be privileged or lightness in some of these uh, uh, measurements and enrollment process. So I'm gonna look here at a few um, uh, findings in recent uh, research and development coming out of the biometric industry to kind of make sense to this uh, for you all in the audience. Because I think that these uh, research and development uh, uh, publications tell us a lot about industry concerns and specifications, and they also tell us a lot about uh, who these technologies are, what kind of bodies these technologies are designed to, to suit best. And so one such study is um, examine how facial recognition technology could be employed in a multi-ethnic environment to classify facial features by race and also by gender. Yes, that's Will Smith right there. And so a technology like this could be applied, for example, in shopping malls, casinos, uh, amusement parks, or something like the photo tagging application that might be used in Facebook or so. So the authors of this study found that when they programmed that their gender classification system generically for all ethnicities, the system was, quote, inclined to classify Africans as males and mongoloids as females. And so the, the, the racial nomenclature of quote unquote mongoloid is seemingly archaic, I know, but not in, uncommon in some of the R&D coming out of uh, this industry. And so with this gender classification system, uh, what, what happened here is that black women became, uh, presumably they, could be, they were read as male most of the time, and Asian men were read as female most of the time uh, with this particular study. And so in this way, it mirrored earlier pseudoscientific racist and sexist discourse that sought to define racial categories and gendered categories in order to regulate these artificial boundaries that can never be fully maintained. So you think here of the black woman as surrogate man or the feminized uh, Asian uh, man. 
So interestingly, in, in this particular study, their gender, for, gender classification classifier was made ethnicity specific for the category African, and they found that images of the African females would still be, would be classified as females 82% of the time. And while that same African classifier would find images of Asian females 95% of the time, and for uh, what they call Caucasoid females 96% of the time. This is a, a study that came out in the late, uh, to, so the early 20 around 2010. So these, these kind of languages of Caucasoid, Mongoloid as well. So meaning that with this particular um, uh, African female classifier, was when it's calibrated to detect black women, the African classifier is better suited at classifying uh, Asian women or uh, uh, as well as Caucasian women or white women. And so using Will Fisk, actor Will Smith's face as a model of generic black masculinity, the study's authors are left to conclude that, quote, the accuracy of gender classifier on Africans is not as high as on, on mongoloid or caucasoid. And so another study, that's end quote, Another study, I'm going to talk a little bit about failure to enroll. Um, th th this, is, uh, uh, this came out in 2009 in a Nikon camera, and the idea that some bodies fail to enroll uh, within uh, these technologies. And these things change once, uh, you know, once these kind of uh, failures reveal themselves, and, and sometimes through Twitter and public ways like this. So in, in another study, we can see how ep epidermalization, and what I mean by that is the imposition of race on the skin, is present, for example, in comparative testing with control groups with higher failure to enroll rates. Um, uh, than others. And so this study state, I'm just going to read, this is a popular quote that's often used in uh, people that research biometric technologies, but it says here, um, elderly users often have very faint fingerprints and may have poorer circulation than younger users. Construction workers and artisans are more likely to have highly worn fingerprints to the point where ridges are nearly non-existent. Users of Pacific Rim slash Asian descent may have faint fingerprint ridges, especially female users, unquote. And so what this quote is telling us is that the elderly, uh, people that come in contact with corrosive or caustic chemicals such as mechanics or nail technicians or manicurists, um, or often have unmeasurable fingerprints. You can think of massage therapists too, or people that have uh, heavy hand washing in their job like uh, nurses or people in, in the healthcare uh, profession. So this question then, uh, th this question this should lead us to ask questions about uh, can these uh, technologies be calibrated to determine gender, race, or class differentiation? Um, in this same study that I just quoted, the authors note that facial kiss scan technology may produce higher failure to enroll rates for d very dark skin users because of the quality of images provided for the facial scan system by uh, video cameras are often optimized for lighter, light skin users. So what their research and development is, is telling us is that certain technologies come to privilege whiteness, or at least lightness, uh, in the ways in which they are uh, lit in the enrollment uh, process, or at least how some bodies are lit in the enrollment process. So you can see the logic of prototypical whiteness operating here, and also with this uh, Canon camera, uh, I'm sorry, Nikon camera here. And so with this, the possibilities of racializing surveillance are, re are revealed. This is especially so when facial recognition technology is calibrated or it's, it's uh, calibrated only to uh, find matches with, from within specific uh, racial and gendered groupings, leading to higher failure and roll rates for some groupings. So the application of surveillance technologies in this way leads to questions concerning the idea that, you know, can gender and race, uh, which are social constructs, be specified by these technologies or programs so? And also, how do transgendered people fit into, within this algorithmic equation. So they are unaccounted for within the algorithm. These research and development reports and articles make clear that there's a certain assumption that these technology, with these technologies that categories of gender identity and race are clear cut and then a machine can be programmed to assign gender categories or what bodies and body parts should signify. So such technologies can then possibly be applied to determine who has access to movement and stability and to other rights. So given this, there are some important questions I think that need to be asked, is how do we understand the body once it's uh, converted into data? What are the underlying assumptions with surveillance technologies such as passport verification machines, facial recognition software, and fingerprint uh, template technology? Well, there's the notions that these technologies are infallible, that they're objective, and that they are based on mathematical precision without error, 
or bias on the part of the computer programmers who calibrate the search parameters of these machines or on part of those who read these templates to make decisions. But I want to return to, uh, so for, this is another one, the idea that uh, uh, you know, some of these technologies might not pick up certain faces if they're within the, how, they're, how they're lit there. Return a little bit to uh, Will Smith. And, and to question what his image is doing in a, uh, a research and development uh, article coming out of the biometrics uh, industry. So Smith is the star of at least three Hollywood blockbusters, uh, action movies in which surveillance technologies play a role. So you can think of Enemy of the State from 1998, iRobot, and also Men in Black. And so seeing how surveillance technology is uh, displayed, uh, discussed, and depicted through Smith's films is very important for understanding the various ways that contemporary surveillance technologies from CCTV to drones to facial recognition technology get marketed to, uh, to, to the public through popular entertainment. Um, so this you can think about as, as kind of like our, our popular biometric consciousness or our popular uh, consciousness around surveillance technologies. So Enemy of the State, uh, his film from 1998, is a panoply um, of surveillance. This is where this image is, for, is from. The film's plot revolves around Smith's character getting caught up uh, in an NSA, in an, in, with the NSA in an uh, assassination plot and then a legislation that will increase domestic spying capabilities that is, as one character puts it, not the first step to the surveillance society, it is the surveillance society. So the film came out, as I mentioned, in 1998. And throughout the film, Smith's character, and by extension, Attention, us as the viewing audience are given a primer on pre-9-11 uh, surveillance technologies and their histories and also their capabilities. Surveillance is wielded in a very kind of conspiratorial manner against uh, Will Smith's character um, in this film. There's facial recognition technology, a uh, fingerprint scan technology, a uh, GPS, databases, CTV, um, beacon transmitter, satellite imagery. There's even like black uh, helicopters that circle around him. So in Enemy of the State, surveillance technologies operate by way of product placement, really. In this kind of a brand integra integration, to use industry terms, the film's viewers come to understand uh, surveillance. And by the end of the film, uh, the lead characters turn the tables on the NSA. And I guess he was like pre-Snowden. Um, they become the ones who watch the watchers. And what this move seemingly tells us is that when placed in the right hand, surveillance technologies lose their negative valence, and it, as, uh, and it need not be feared or cause for worry. And of course, these right hands are gendered in a particular way in this film. So popular cultural representations of surveillance are some of the ways in which the public comes to understand these technologies and how we come to see biometrics technologies as, necess as a necessary security measure, even for getting on our laptops or our phones, um, and how they get you know, rationalized and sold to the general public. You could call this, a, a, as I said, a popular biometric consciousness. And as a pitch man, it doesn't get much better than uh, Will Smith, who was named one of the highest paid actors by Forbes in 2008. And so he's often the star of, as I mentioned, many blockbuster films where the audience is, 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 is often subject uh, to uh, his heroic uh, exploits, particularly when his films become uh, on syndicated networks every weekend. So their lessons about this surveillance technologies and practices are regularly broadcasted with, with Smith in a starring role. He's often seen saving America and by extension the planet from alien others, whether it's Independence Day or I Am Legend, Hancock, Wild Wild West. Um, interestingly, when he was promoting iRobot in uh, 2004, he was in Germany and he was asked by the German press about the effects of 9-11. And I'm going to do my, ger my uh, German translation with Google Translate here. But he, uh, his answer was, if you grew up as a black man in America, you have a very different view of the world than white Americans. We blacks live with a constant feeling of malaise. And if you're attacked by a racist cop now and wounded or attacked by terrorists, excuse me, it makes no difference. In the 60s, blacks were constantly the target of terrorist attacks. And while it was civil terrorism, but terrorism is terrorism, we are accustomed to being attacked. As for a permanent alert, alert, a defensive attitude with which one lives anyway, has not changed since. No, not for me personally. As to my everyday life, the tragedy of September 11th changed nothing. I live anyway, always 100% alert. I was not even nervous, anxious, or cautious after 9-11. So what Will Smith is articulating there is the racial terror imposed on black life in America by an overseeing surveillance apparatus that was in effect on September 10th, 2001, and long before that. And he's giving us a bit of black counterframing as well, too. So 
So given this, the histories, the failure to enroll rates, the idea around prototypical whiteness, uh, racializing surveillance, I'm calling for a critical biometric consciousness. And this is uh, following uh, Eugene Tucker's call for a critical genomic consciousness. And a critical biometric consciousness entails uh, informed uh, public debate around these technologies and their application. It's a demand uh, by, of accountability by the state and by private sectors who you know, might have our, our data, uh, trade it, sell it, uh, rent it out. And it's a critical biometric technology uh, sees biometric technology and the owner and access to the ownership and access to one's own body data and information that is uh, derived or generated from one's body data. So think about the idea of your fingerprint being turned into a code and that being your uh, uh, intellectual property. That must be understood as a right. And as well, importantly, this uh, consciousness must also understand the kind of historical connections between contemporary biometric information technology and its historical antecedents. Meaning here that a critical biometric consciousness must contend with the ways in which branding, and particularly racial slavery, was instituted as a means of population management in the making, marking, and marketing of blackness as visible and as commodity. I think another thing is important uh, to think about here is the use of a conflict minerals in these technologies to, to produce them. Or the people that, uh, and Lisa Nakamura has done uh, work on this, the people that produce these technologies as well too. So a consciousness about uh, the implications of those things as well too. And so as I mentioned, a critical biometric consciousness must contend with the ways in which branding was a form of punishment and racial profiling, the idea of everybody marks society, or F for fugitive, uh, but perhaps that F stand for, stood for freedom, and R, rather than standing for runaway, could stand for revolt, so a critical repur repurposing of that. So much of how biometrics are languaged in R&D derives from the racial thinking and assumptions around gender, gender that were used to falsify evolutionary trajectories that rationalized uh, violence, the violence of transatlantic slavery, colonialism, genocide, imperialism. And so the absence of a discussion of how such racial thinking shapes the research and development of contemporary biometric information technology is in itself constitutive of the power relations existing in that very technology. So the idea of get, that blackness gets invoked through Will Smith or something like that uh, uh, as well. So in conclusion, this talk began by offering a longer history of biometric information technology and the ways in which the history is in close alignment with the commodification of blackness. So current uh, biometric technologies, of course, and slave branding are not one and the same. However, when we think about our contemporary moment when suspect citizens, trusted travelers, refugee claimants, incarcerated people, welfare recipients, and others are having their bodies informationalized by way of biometric surveillance, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes without consent uh, or awareness, or sometimes with coerced consent, and then stored in large-scale automated databases, some of these databases owned by the state and some owned by private interests, my suggestion here is that we must question the historically present workings of branding and racializing surveillance, particularly in regard to biometric uh, technology, for a crit critical rethinking of uh, punishment, torture, and moments of contact with their, our increasingly technological border. And so this is especially uh, uh, true or uh, important given the capabilities of non-cooperative uh, biometric tagging by way of drones or, uh, or, or biometrics employed uh, in U.S. counterinsurgency measures and other military applications, for example, targeted killings or this for search and rescue missions. So understanding how biometric information technologies are rationalized through industry specifications and popular entertainment provides a, a means of falsifying the idea that certain technologies and their applications are always neutral regarding race, gender, disabilities, and other categories of dis determination in their various intersections. Examining biometric practices and surveillance in this way invites us to see how integral an understanding of the conditions of blackness is to developing a general theory of surveillance. Thank you. Yes, question, yeah. Is it Dana? Yeah. <laughs> I want to read across your paper for a second because, so face recognition technologies are almost all made in China. Mm -hmm. which is in itself, really fascinating. Which actually, the languages of Mongoloid and Caucasoid mean something very different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the histories, both of translation and, and cultural appropriation. Race. And so I'm curious, in light of your project, how you would read across it from a Chinese perspective, which has such a different history mm -hmm. of race, of slavery, of you know the ways in which surveillance operates in relation. 
relationship to the state. And I think that there's something about that cross-cultural mm -hmm. construct that's very much embedded in your project. And I'm curious how you would respond or think about it. Yeah, and I'm still trying to think about it, but think about it through Will Smith and this kind of international... Yeah. He's loved. He's one of mm -hmm. the crossover cultural characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's the Fresh Prince. <laughs> Yeah, or something, or something like that. Yeah, and so, so very different histories, but there's there was something still transnational about this, about the commodification of blackness, and particularly uh, in in I think not particularly, but in China as well too. And so, um, so I, I do kind of have to gesture more to the to the difference between the terms, and that they're still uh, possibly in use, but those terms are still informing things, like for example, like this. Right, and so, so what, what does it mean when these products are then sold uh, at a global level? And so, um, so, that's, so those are the kind of larger questions to ask on a micro and macro scale. How do we answer all these questions? And maybe I'm just trying to, uh, to think through some of it. There. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I see those languages and those cultural practices. Mm-hmm. In some ways parallel, and in some ways they end up bleeding into each other. Yes. Because through those technologies as a screened bridge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly. But then you still see with that one particular um, uh, research that black women became masculinized, even when the technology was, uh, was specified to read black women, like race and gender, they were still read as a man. Even, and, and that African identifier would read white women as white women, but not uh, you know, as, as uh, a black women. And so some of these things, these, histor these histories and race of, race of racial classification, even in the 21st century, uh, still exist. And then when you see that language there, it gets a bit kind of tricky. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, sure. Of the body, yeah. right? When, when, you, when, the, when the phone can be something, and particularly with um, 3D printing to make a, you know, a fingerprint. And so would it become more and more internalized? Like we, we leave our fingerprints around, but we don't necessarily leave our iris uh, prints you know, around the place, right? We might have the same kind of uh, histories of criminalization as well, too. And so I don't know if I, if I think that privacy or our right to privacy, particularly in public spaces, or our face, or our body, would be the, um, the, the, I guess, the strand to, to go by making rights claims for this. And maybe it's about uh, uh, a shared, not a shared ownership, but at least having some uh, say in ownership in our body data and how those things are, you know, sold or traded. So, for example, uh, one of my students, I, I asked them if they would give away their fingerprints to cross a border, and one of them told me like she uses her fingerprints to get in the pool by her house. And so the idea, well, I want to get in the pool, you know. And so people give up these things. And I asked, you know, what what happens? Is your is your um, housing uh, uh, agency or housing people taking care of your finger, are they selling it, are they, is it in a, sec a secured space? And many people, it's just about, for them, just about the good, she's got to go to the pool and it's not a big deal. And so I, I, some of these concerns, maybe not everyone else, uh, you know, uh, takes them up in the way that I, I might, but I think that we should have still a discussion about, uh, about that because this idea of function creep, that something might be used for a driver's license, then is used to get into a pool, um, uh, th th there should be some kind of maybe uh, regulations, and not necessarily by the state, but maybe by... Uh, uh, some other, and I can give you an example of one here. Um, this here is uh, Mark Bulan uh, from the Open Biometrics Institute, and this is the Keeper of Key machine. And it's a kind of a performance piece, but it's the idea that, well, A, would you just walk up to a machine in the middle of like a mall and give your fingerprint and not question, then would you just, you know, would you, would you then give it to a driver's license, uh, especially ones that are outsourced uh, to the state? And so what this does is you walk up there and you get a, a scan, 
and it doesn't actually hold the data, so you actually get a printout here of perhaps these are spaces in which, um, you, this is not like the photoshopped, Adobe Photoshop fingerprint that you might get, but this is the one where these particular uh, nods here could be spaces that may, you know, you can think about Brandon Mayfield whose fingerprints were wrongly said to be involved in the uh, Madrid uh, uh, subway bombing, the idea that, uh, f falsely so. Um, you'll then get something called a good scan that you can then print out and keep if you were ever to come up in a situation like, say, Brandon Mayfield or being falsely accused of your fingerprints being left someplace, which might be important now that people can, you know, create 3D scans and, then, and, and have these kind of fingerprints or gummy scans as well, too. And so those are one ways in which, I guess, creative practices like this from the Open Biometric Institute can get us to think about privacy or also um, uh, the storage of data and who, ho who owns what data about you. I think so that's maybe one question. Hi. I was wondering what you would say about technology that is specifically designed to classify people by release. Yeah, but, and I think that you raise a good point about the census because it was always, and, and I think when I talked at the beginning about slave branding and the idea that the Dutch would brand and the British and other s countries to kind of separate their human cargo from the other, that these were always uh, practices of the racial state, whether it was the census or, uh, or slave branding. And so you can see some of these technologies now moving into not necessarily the state, but back to the corporate with 23andMe. And I think there was a recent um, uh, decision that they can no longer uh, do genetic uh, pr uh, pr predictive or as uh, Dana maybe you know it keeps, <laughs> it keeps changing so so I, I guess those are kind of um, lets us know that uh, although it, uh, it's the, the race as a social contract has very material uh, 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 effects, particularly uh, with the state and its, its need to manage and control populations and there's actually with I guess with 23andMe quite a profit uh, in it yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, where you started out, you, you started by talking about incarcerated um, bodies. And I'm thinking, when I think about incarcerated bodies, I think about um, surplus population. Okay. And so I'm curious as, I, I guess I'm curious about how um, you see not just branding um, and sort of like paraphernalia and commodification of like Black Americana, um, as well as securitization sort of fitting into the production of surplus populations Mm -hmm. um, so, so in thinking about securitization, I think about um, state management of populations, um, and particularly um, people of color, and part of that being the production of surplus population or managing surplus population. And so, I'm just, I guess, I'm just curious um, if you could talk a little bit about how this, what everything that you're talking about, um, fits. So you mean what I didn't talk about here? <laughs> I mean, I can look at um, this particular uh, piece by uh, Hank Willis Thomas, and it's 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 a, a from his uh, branded uh, uh, collection, and this one is actually um, at the taken at the funeral of his uh, cousin, uh, gun shooting death. So when you talk about uh, uh, social death or surplus populations or populations that are made surplus. Um, uh, I think this is uh, one example. And so this is uh, th also through this particular project and looking at the uh, kind of commodification of blackness, but the history here, one of the things you'll see is uh, that picking, uh, the idea that uh, uh, picking the perfect casket, he does, looks at the history from picking cotton to uh, premature death of, of, of black, black males and the idea of, from a nine millimeter pistol, the bullet, gold chain, new socks, three piece suit, uh, picking the perfect casket for your son, uh, 
priceless. And so you see the, the family's grief there speaks to not only the kind of, um, it's interesting there with, with MasterCard being there, the long histories of the banking industry that had to, that was dealing in human bodies now profiting off bodies, whether it's through, you know, paying for the funeral on a credit card or the idea of um, uh, the indebtedness to uh, black life. Uh, of these companies still while they're still, uh, you know, uh, making money um, off of them. And so I, I think, yes, I think this, uh, like the work that I presented here around biometric technologies and the, and the long histories of marking certain bodies for death or certain bodies for to labor unfreely, um, you can still see this kind of uh, uh, reverberations now in the contemporary prison uh, where, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess, spaces that were, you know, prison towns become repopulated with uh, these uh, prisons uh, that can, uh, th that warehouse uh, black and brown bodies. And so I think that uh, these kind of, my, my work is to make an intervention to say that these histories are, of, are missing and, and drawing the links between uh, the prison industrial complex and then the earlier kind of histories of that too. Dana? of that with regard to race. One of the things I would provoke you to also think about it is the way in which biometrics also connect us to other people through networks. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that you know, the ruling this summer that Marilyn, Marilyn B. King, that collecting uh, DNA samples is akin to connecting photoprints at the point of arrest, mm -hmm. actually is really interesting in, light, in the light of the fact that your DNA actually connects you to all sorts of other people. Yes. And so what happens is that the state then inevitably collects large databases of black bodies mm -hmm. because it's not just the individuals but the connections and relationships they have to everybody else. And yeah. so then, therefore, what does race get instantiated into these other networks? Mm -hmm. Not because of the individual body, but as the individual body in relationship to other bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fun to think about to networks, think about networks and, and consent as well too because my DNA can tell a lot about my brother and so you know if I'm like for example um, there was a case once uh, in Toronto where they went around uh, asking for people you know just give us a swipe and then you'll be uh, you'll be uh, counted out of this particular crime as they were looking for someone and the idea of consent well I can consent to someone but I'm not consenting to everyone in my house and what does it mean when you collect when this is then collected or stored or traded as well too and so those networks of communities uh, but also uh, uh, communities being uh, I guess these kind of carceral practices as well to just through a, a simple swipe or a simple nail or something as well that has to speak to um, you know our, our critical consciousness around these technologies too. Yeah, I think I'll add that, yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I don't necessarily see surveillance as something being negative or having a negative valence to it, and that there's really productive possibilities. And so in some cases, like uh, film the police, and you can see uh, uh, whether it is the stop and frisk app by the uh, New York Civil Liberties Union that in some way can crowdsource a filming of, say, a stop and frisk happening, and that could be used to, um, I guess, crowdsource a witnessing as well, too. Or even the idea of people taking selfies of themselves. Uh, there was recently the uh, hashtag started by a, a co-started by a student at University of Texas called Feminist Selfie, and it was kind of to challenge this idea that um, if people are subject to, say, um, uh, 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 anti-black violence, or their, their beauty and their selves are not necessarily um, uh, uh, viewed as pleasurable in the public sphere, that, that the idea that, you need, that someone would actually find pleasure in posting themselves or looking at themselves as a way of, uh, of, of, of supporting their existence. So I think that the idea of, of uh, visibility and surveillance, uh, I don't necessarily see one as uh, being negative and one, even though it's, it's sometimes about equalizing uh, that in some way. And I think spaces like 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 an Instagram or like a, a stop and frisk app or a film the police are, are some ways in which this kind of a certain a parody and a kind of dark surveillance could happen uh, in those spaces. Hi. Hi. In uh, the couple of published pieces that we read for the class, uh -huh. as opposed to everybody who's here for DHI, you make a, a kind of fascinating connection between slavery and the institutions of surveillance under slavery and past the past system branding mm -hmm. all that and passports and the role that you know sort of the the, the 
Book of Negroes plays. Uh -huh. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more. You didn't touch on that in your yeah. talk, but I, I found that a kind of very suggestive connection because, of course, the instruments of control in the 18th century, and certainly before there was photography, require a whole different sort of technology. And you, you, you're suggesting in some ways that, that the regulation of slavery and slaves, the enslaved people, is sort of what drives this forward. And, and I just wonder if you'd say a little bit. Yeah, yeah, thank you for reading that. Um, the, well, one of the things that when I was doing that research, that I, since I'm in New York City now, was looking at the what I call lantern laws, and these laws from the early 1700s that uh, regulated that uh, black mixed race and indigenous slaves, uh, if they were walking uh, after dark in New York City with, uh, without being accompanied by a white person, they had to have a lit lamp or could be subject to seizure or taken to the police station. And to kind of seeing that as the kind of uh, uh, the uh, the historical precedent, or I guess the legal formation of say stop and frisk happening right now in New York City, to say that there are long histories then if we just kind of make those connections. And so with the passport, I was, uh, the, the Book of Negroes is a, a, a list of uh, 3,000 uh, black people who had self-emancipating, uh, had fought with the British, uh, and then eventually had passage to Canada, some to Germany, and also some to, the, uh, to England. And their names were recorded in a Book of Negroes, but it would also list, uh, uh, any type of scars that they received uh, from the kind of labor that they did or even their trade as well too. And so I call this one of the first documents that linked uh, biometrics uh, to a right to travel. And so people could be blind in one eye. Uh, they would say mixed ra or, or mulatto, uh, a young woman. And so um, if we just kind of rethink our histories of the passport and uh, uh, situate them uh, or at least acknowledge um, the, uh, the histories of regulating blackness, we can have, you know, a, a, a maybe a different uh, understanding of some uh, uh, historical and also contemporary surveillance practices. And I think that those lantern laws are one space in which uh, that plays, plays true. Um, I had a question about um, a kind of movement within DH that's called critical code studies. Mm -hmm. that is looking at how um, various concepts get kind of encoded in uh, uh, various forms of code. And I was just wondering if you're aware or know of how racial difference actually gets encoded in the in the biometric software at all, or um, if anyone's sort of been looking into that? Oh, I, I don't know, unless it was something like exactly what I was showing you. You mean like something like, sorry, this here? But more like at the, at the actual level of the, of, the, of, the, of the code, like how different um, you know, races are, how it shows up in the actual code behind the software. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not too sure, okay. yeah. But something like Wendy Chun's work, I think, would be one place that I would go to look for something like that. And also um, some new work by uh, Mark Anthony Neal and Jessica Marie Johnson on uh, black codes, the history of black codes or regulating of blackness to kind of contemporary black codes of, uh, of, of ways of speaking, ways of, of knowing, uh, and kind of making those connections there. I think those are kind of, I guess, three people that I would look to to answer those questions. But I, I don't know code studies, so thank you. Oh. Could you, I just want to go back to the, the, the image of Wilson Chin. Okay. An image I know pretty well. Uh -huh. Thank you, yeah. Um, my sense is that that was done in the South, in Louisiana, the mm -hmm. picture was taken. Mm -hmm. Is that your understanding of it? Yes. It wasn't brought up to New York, even though it's a New York agency that is. That, takes, that took the picture? Yeah, so this is, this is the year after the Civil War starts and New Orleans is, is yeah. liberated by the Union Navy. Yeah, I, I think, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. I'm just gonna say, and he's used as a kind of, he's put on stage, if yes. you will, to show people in the North the barbarities of slavery. So he's sort of acting that. Yes. That was my understanding. Yes, because there's another one where those kinds of, uh, those tools of correction and instruments of torture are on his feet and he's standing in very defiantly on top of them. Um, there's, he's also posed with the emancipated uh, slave children that were taken in New York City as a way of, uh, there's some interesting, uh, of, uh, of, uh, they're, they're supposed to be white looking slave children to, uh, to, to kind of pull on the heartstrings of liberals because to, to fund the school for free, uh, free colored children in Louis, uh, New Orleans. And they'd be taken around the country uh, or, or use these cart de visites which would sell for like 25 cents to raise money as well too. And Wilson Chin, in some of the pictures, he would be, uh, there's one about the love of learning 
morning where he is sitting uh, with the three children and there's one uh, Charlie, one boy who's at the same kind of frame or line of sight. And so you see uh, in some of those pictures, some people have read that as the kind of making of the, the color line within African American civil society with Wilson Chin uh, and, and, these, and, these, and these children. And so, so, so yeah, so this is staged very much yeah. so uh, uh, as well too. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>